My name is John Janovey, Jr. I was uh, born in Louisiana, uh, moved to Tulsa at a fairly young age, at about three or four, and then grew up in Oklahoma City for the rest of the time. Went to the University of Oklahoma, um, received a bachelor's degree in mathematics in 1959, and a master's in zoology, and then a PhD in 65. Went to Rutgers, um, postdoc research, came to the University of Nebraska, 1966, been here ever since, as a biology teacher. Well, uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a great time at the University of Oklahoma for 10 long years, uh, with a little short stint in the Army in between. Um, I, I was always a, always a hunter and, and a fisherman, and so I was in the out in the nature, out in the field a lot. Um, and other than that, I think uh, I spent a lot of time in the field as a, uh, as a graduate student. And I think uh, that was pretty educational, in addition to whatever formal coursework. Okay. Well, we grew up, uh, when I lived in Oklahoma City as a child, we lived really on the edge of town. In a, in a new uh, subdivision. And it was very easy to walk to places where you could go hunting and, and trapping and fishing. And so as soon as I got really old enough to have my own weapons, <laughs> I spent a lot of time with friends. And so I think the, uh, the imagery of, of that part of Oklahoma, the, the, the plains and the, the um, creeks that were cut down into that red clay and all of that, sort of was the imagery of my childhood. And then, especially in graduate school, when I did my research on bird malaria in Kansas, and that research area was right in the middle of Kansas in a place called the Cheyenne Bottoms. And that was exceedingly prairie, prairie wetland, prairie marsh. And so I think the through all of my formative years, just the visual imagery was that of the prairie. Not necessarily unplowed prairie, but flat, relatively flat. Well, I think certainly uh, my both of my parents were pretty intellectual people, and I think they put a put a high value on on certainly on books. And my grandfather was. Uh, it's hard to describe what he really was, but he, <laughs> I don't think he ever had a real profession. But he was, he was a person who was always interested in books and, and history and nature, and particularly Native American um, history. And, so, and when he died, I really recovered all of his big library of all of this stuff. So I think these, these folks had a, quite an influence on what you talked about, what you thought about at the time, the daily conversation. Um, I think the um, the one person I met uh, as a graduate student was a, a faculty member named George Sutton, an ornithologist at OU, who was really the first person I met who um, was very open about his writing and about his use of literature in teaching, not necessarily biological literature, but literature literature in teaching advanced biology classes. And he was also an artist. And so there was a role model there of a person who simply by his behavior endorsed the activity of writing and painting and art. Well, I don't make my living as a writer. I make my living as a scientist. But um, all scientists write all of the time. Actually, I, I've, um, I've been thinking about this a little bit. I think my first quasi-published um, writing was in the Harding Junior High School newspaper in Oklahoma City, where for some reason or another I enrolled in a journalism class. I'm not sure I knew what journalism was at the time. But I enrolled in that journalism class, and my first assignment was to go interview a fellow student who was what we called at the time a displaced person, uh, an immigrant from 
Latvia, and this was not long after World War II. And so I interviewed this young lady and wrote a story about her. And I, I do, I distinctly remember that experience. <laughs> then there, uh, but as a as a scientist, you uh, you write all of the time, and particularly as a faculty member, everything from memos to uh, committee reports to grant proposals, lots and lots of proposals trying to convince people to give you money. So you're a writer. Well, nowadays, the um, question is, do I need to write? I, that's a good question. It's sort of a habit. It's, I guess it's a, if I don't do something fairly creative about every day, I start worrying about it. And so I guess maybe, yeah, and it's not only the writing, but it's also a little bit of art and dumb as it sounds, putting your PowerPoint shows together for class. When you, when you look back on it, it really is assembling a document that's a combination of narrative and pictures. I mean, it really is. Well, um, the things that inspire me to write, good ideas for one thing, uh, I do. I take a lot of notes about things that um, I think need to be said. Uh, I find that uh, anger is a really an excellent motivating <laughs> emotion. You know, you get very irritated at something, and you get and you stay irritated long enough, then it sustains the effort. Well, you know, the old, the old advice, writer advice, to write about what you know is, is good advice. And so I, I tend to choose biological materials. Um, I, I, I do a lot of, when I'm working on a project, I do a lot of library research, a lot of literary research, a lot of things that I, studying a lot of things that I might not do otherwise just to publish the scientific work that we would do. So uh, I, dr I draw on nature, and I draw on uh, natural materials, and, but I also tend to view those materials as if through a diverse set of lenses, sort of metaphorically speaking, um, because that's what I do professionally. So I may look at something under a dissecting microscope, I may look at something through binoculars, and so that whole, in fact, this book, Pieces of the Plains, there's a section in there called Through a Lens, and that talks about that habit of viewing nature from all different kinds of distances and perspectives. So uh, I think that, uh, no, I just uh, look at stuff, and very often I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll save a picture of that, or I'll take a picture of that, and the digital age has has really almost made that uh, an unhealthy habit. Uh, you t I, I take literally thousands of digital images with the intent of eventually using those as some kind of research material or writing material or something of the sort. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I know where they all are. <laughs> They are saved somewhere. Well, it varies. Um, the, the, my, I'm generally a morning person, and um, there are plenty of, there were many years when, um, particularly when I was working on Keith County Journal and Yellow Legs, those early books, that I would I would write. I would do my creative writing very early in the morning, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, nowadays, and this has been true probably for the last ten years. Nowadays, I do my schoolwork at three and four in the morning. And when I when I get to the university, the first thing I do is go over to the union, get some coffee, and write for an hour. So it's I've traded that, but it's all almost always before noon. I'm not a late night creative person at all. 
Well, um, I think people, there have been people who have commented on my writing that it's passive, passive, very passive voice, that it's an exemplar of the passive voice. And I, I think that's probably true, and I think it comes from uh, the style of science writing uh, that, at least that I do. I, I think that very often when you're writing pure science, then that passive voice tends to give your work um, a little more authority or a little more of a, um, a sort of a global historical component. You know, say, these fish were collected in order to study the following concepts on apply, as opposed to, I went out to the river and caught some fish to get their parasites. So it's the, you know, it's the same thing, active versus passive, but I think I tend to use a lot of descriptive uh, language, a lot of uh, describing plants and animals and settings. There's a lot of descriptive narrative text and descriptive text in my writing, and so that is, is pretty passive. In terms of style, um, yeah, I, I work real hard, and I don't know how successfully, but I work hard to to have kind of a almost a classroom lecture, a combination classroom lecture conversational style. And when I go back and read those paragraphs, it it almost seems to me they're saying, okay, take notes in this way or something. <laughs> Well, my audience, the, the people who tell me they enjoy my books are usually fairly well educated. Uh, they, tend to, they tend to be thinkers. They tend to be broad readers, tend to be people who will use the library. Uh, they uh, are not necessarily airport travelers. <laughs> so. I, I think you know the the general educated public who thinks seriously about the past, the present, and the future. I, and I don't know what fraction of the population that is, but that's who my audience is. Well, I think most of my most of my books, most everything that's in all of my books is based on observation and evidence of some kind as opposed to making up stories. So I think most of my writing is very much grounded in reality. Uh, it may not read like a piece of science necessarily, but it's, it's very solidly grounded in observations about nature, observations about uh, the universe. And so I think that um, the overall take-home message is uh, a, a desire to help people see the world in terms of how it really is as opposed to how they necessarily want it to be or imagine it to be. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of delusion out there, particularly among the political crowd, over uh, what this world is really like. And I try to, I try to steer my reading audience away from that delusion a little bit. <laughs> well, I as a as a university faculty member, I, I think for at least thirty, maybe thirty-five years, uh, my students have written a lot, especially for a science class, and especially for introductory science class. There were years before the internet when uh, my classes of 250 students would write four or five papers a semester over uh, subjects that that were almost impossible for them to, to write. And the idea there was was really a contract so that if they would write what I ask them to, for the extent that I ask them to write about it, then I would give them full credit. So, uh, you know, a typical um, a typical assignment might be 
go choose your favorite campus, campus plant. Now, tell me in three double-spaced pages exactly why you chose that without once mentioning all the unmentionables, you know, the money, politics, health, sex, sports, religion, um, those, those, whatever those are. And that's not a, that's not a trivial task. I think the first sentence there is pretty easy, and the rest of the three pages is, is a real lesson. And I, I, I've done that for at least 30, maybe 35 years. When the Internet got up and running, those papers got so boring that uh, we, we went to a different kind of a writing activity. So for the last several years, my students have written the last 15 minutes of every Friday class, they've done extemporaneous writing on a prompt that they don't, they don't know what it is. And then they have to come back, pick that up, um, type it out double spaced as if it were a real manuscript, and then give me a page of self-assessment on that. So they do this for 15 weeks. And at the end of the 15 weeks, they've written a lot. And of course, I've read thousands of pages of their writing and from all of that 30 to 35 years of experience I've done a lot of incur well two things first of all I've seen a lot of really bad writing and I've seen a lot of really good writing and I've seen a surprising number of Nebraska children who are really good but for some reason or another Nobody along the way has said to them, this is one of your real life strengths and real life tools. Now, use it. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. So I, it, it's, yeah, I encourage people. And in terms of what I ask them to do, I try very hard to bring out intellectual activities that they wouldn't normally uh, express I, a few a few a few points you can bribe students to do almost anything with a few points <laughs> intellectually that is <laughs> I'm always working on several several projects both scientific writing and book projects um, I have a number of, of scientific papers that, that we're in the process of working on, data from graduate students who have been in the lab recently and are finishing up their writing, um, some theoretical work uh, with a math prof, uh, some computer programming, uh, you know, just that sort of stuff. Um, I'm working on, working on a book uh, about in about evolution for politicians. Uh, that one is sort of in the submission stage right now, and I'm I'm sending the proposals to uh, my agent. The um, I'm working on working on one about my parents, and I'm going to read a little bit from that book now. It's a result of uh, result of cleaning out. Uh, their house, you know, when they passed away. Okay. Those are the two big ones. And then I have a parasitology textbook that's like a, a, a thousand pound gorilla on your back that shows up every four years and says, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> well, the pieces, I, I'm going to read from Pieces of the Plains, which is my latest uh, real book. Um, this is a book that uh, Rhonda and Jim Seacrest supported. And Jim Seacrest, who is a Nebraska notable, uh, took me to lunch one day and said, uh, I'd like to support a book that you can write. And I said, any book that you want to write? And I said, OK. Sounds like a good idea. And then he started giving me some hints. And once he finished with the hints, it became obvious that, that book project was a little more challenging than maybe you know, I couldn't just pull something out of the files. So this is not really a memoir so much as it is an exploration of where scientists come from using myself as a, a subject matter 
and what you what life is like being a biologist and then what you uh, what you think about at, as a result of being a biologist namely the future so this book has three parts and and I'll read some from uh, from actually from a chapter that's mainly about my wife's Karen's childhood and that seemed like a good place to start <clears throat> and people love that chapter <laughs> Then I'm also going to read some from the Oklahoma book, which is the one about my parents. No, it really is a great honor and a great privilege to be asked to be one of the Ames readers. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith McGowan. I am the curator of the Heritage Room, and I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John A. James Reading Series. We're excited that this reading series has been in existence for more than 25 years. The Ames readings are currently held on the third Sunday of the month at 2 p.m., and here you are. Thanks for being here. This is the 195th reading in the series. We are here in the Jane Pobgeski Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. This is a special collection dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. It's a representative collection of more than 13,000 volumes written by more than 3,000 Nebraska authors. We also have information files, magazines, pictures, manuscripts, artwork, and other memorabilia. Uh, for example, we do have some, uh, p some carvings and some bird paintings by uh, Paul Johnsgaard, but we also have a painting of a bird by John Janery as well, so you might want to look around before you leave the room. And by the way, the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It is supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. We'd like to thank the NLHA for the endowment established a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. And we do invite you to visit the Heritage Room during our regular public service hours. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3 and on Sundays from 2 to 5. And actually, we're open right now because it is 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. Um, the Ames readings are filmed by five, 5 City TV. And for those of you who are not here in the Heritage Room but are watching this on Channel 5, we are located on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library at 14th and N Streets in downtown Lincoln. Our reader today is John Janovey, the Barnard Professor of Biological Sciences at UNL. John was born in Louisiana raised in Oklahoma, and he has been a professor at UNL since 1966, I think. During his years at the university, he has received a number of honors, and I could go on for quite a while, I think, there, but since we're in the Heritage Room, I thought it was especially appropriate to mention several literary awards. The Nebraska Library Association awarded John the Mari Sandoz Award at one point, and the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association um, gave him the Literary Heritage Award some years ago, too. He's been the director of the School of Biological Sciences Cedar Point Biological Station, and he has written a lot. Most recently, he wrote Pieces of the Plains, Memories and Predictions from the Heart of America, and I'm sure that we'll hear more about that book shortly. We're very happy to have John here with us today, and if you could please help me welcome him, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much, Meredith. It's, uh, it really is a great honor to be a part of this activity. Um, I, not only did I know Jane Geske well as a personal friend and uh, a great admirer, but I think this Heritage Room is a truly remarkable, uh, a truly remarkable institution for not only the city of Lincoln, but especially for the state of Nebraska and those who are creative writers here in, in Nebraska. I'm going to, um, going to read a few things from a couple of, a couple of books, but I want to talk about them a little bit first. Uh, this first item is from chapter one of this book, Pieces of the Plains. Uh, this is a book that was supported, uh, the publication of it was supported by Rhonda and Jim Seacrest, who are uh, great investors of, of uh, time and talents and resources in the state of Nebraska and in the people of Nebraska. 
And Jim took me to lunch one time and said, I'd like to publish any book that you'll write. And of course I had in mind at that point some wild science fiction or something. And then he started uh, suggesting some topics and by the time he got finished with the list of topics, I knew that this had to be something quite different than, than I imagined at the beginning. And so it turned out to be um, a book about uh, where, where scientists, particularly biologists, where biologists come from, what kind of experiences sort of set them as, apart from uh, the general public and uh, especially from those who, who view the world quite differently than a, a naturalist would. And so uh, I started with an Oklahoma upbringing, and my resident uh, Oklahoma expert, Karen, my wife, uh, had a, also had a very rich and interesting intellectual and emotional history in Oklahoma. And so I drew upon some um, writing that I had done years earlier for another project and drew upon some of her experiences uh, to start this book. And then so the middle part of this book is really about practicing biology, and the last part of it is what a scientist thinks about, which is mostly the future and what's going to happen. So what I'm going to read here in a minute or two is this uh, are a couple of pages from this first chapter, which is entitled Ethel, uh, and, and it's really all dry, all based on a visit that uh, Karen and I and our children took to her aunt's farm in Woodward, Oklahoma. <clears throat> Karen's mother had died when, when Karen was a, a small child, well, a small child, age seven, and she was then sent by her father out to live with Aunt Ethel for a while as a result of that. And in the middle of the summer and out, outside of Woodward, Oklahoma, you can imagine it's hot and it's dry and, and the cicadas are, are maturing. And so this cicada, uh, song has really been a part of our uh, married life for all those 50 years and the three or four years we were going together and engaged before that. And so it just seemed natural to start a book about uh, nature with cicadas. He'd often thought, and, oh, and this is also written sort of in third person because when I put this chapter together, uh, I was thinking about a photographer who had John Spence, who had taken a group of photographs of various scenes and gave me a stack of those pictures. And I brought them home and showed them to Karen, and I knew exactly. And she looked at the first one and said, These make me sad. I knew exactly why, because it reminded her of Woodward, Oklahoma. So when I wrote this, I put myself in the position of the photographer. He'd often thought about the lives of cicadas, how they were a part of his own childhood, too, but not the same kind of part. His mother hadn't died when he was seven, and besides, in those days, boys were supposed to be curious about squirmy things, toads, snakes, various bugs. But girls were supposed to be afraid. While he and a friend would spend the night with a flashlight watching the cicada emerge from its nymphal case, waiting for its wings to unfold and harden, saying to one another, if you touch it now, it will never fly. She would lie in the afternoon back bedroom, surrounded by old furniture, listening to the rise and the fall of the cicada's song, then the chorus of churring and wonder if her mother was in heaven. For him, the insects were creatures of the night, the secret climb onto rough walls or limbs, the agonizing ecdysis, the dark hours of soft, flightless vulnerability, with finally a rattling dash into hiding, clutched beneath a twig, high in the elms when there were still elms in the city, with the morning warmth. His midnight flashlight, trained until the batteries died on the persistent imago, symbolized his relationship with the natural world. His excitement came with doing something nobody else did. Watch the locusts at night, see them in important times, do what the birds could not do, peel away the protective darkness, watch the acquisition of flight, then smile, then go back to his bedroom while the world slept, stole, killed, writhed beneath the covers and called it life and pondered for a while before sleep the discoveries he'd made for a hundredth time. But for her, cicadas were creatures of the day, the afternoon. They were markers of major events in human lives. She would never hear another one without expecting a change, usually one she could not control. 
She had an expression, a look of the past. She was the vulnerable one, the receiver, the one who responded. Her thoughts were made by what happened to those around her. 30 years, and if she lived that long, 60 or 70 years could go by, and anyone who'd been with her that summer in Woodward would be taken back there by the look on her face when she heard the cicadas. It's all gone, said the look. My childhood, my aunt and uncle, the farm, physical assurance of a grandmother and a mother, carefree happiness of a little girl, the caring in times of sorrow, gone into the Oklahoma wind, gone with the leaves, paint on the barn, all gone except the cicadas. She never wanted things to change. She wanted to stay a child, her own children to stay children, her parents to stay alive, and her aunts and uncles. She did not like death, did not consider it educational, but the world would not wait for her. The grinding politics of war, starvation, the clearing of vast forests, rivers sucked dry, chemicals poisoning the soil, drugs, schoolboy bullets in their classmates' brains, tangled shards of steel and blood and broken glass along the highway, missiles in a silo on a prairie, the hopeless clash of race, religion, all came to her in the endless parade of, quote, news, unquote. It never ended, this mess of a lone world drifting in the hollow arm of a galaxy. The cicadas sang. She did not want to go where the songs took her. The journey would erase all that had gone wrong since she was seven years old. But the songs would also erase all that had gone right. From the paradox came the look on her face, the churring in the heat said in falling, rising words, good and bad, only one with the other. Wandering among the buildings, he took some pictures. He knew they would not show what he had in his mind. In the negatives, there were never enough contrast for him, never a fraction of what he could see in the gray boards, a rusted nail driven decades ago, the barbed wire hidden in a tangle of wild plum, all telling him of the hardest work and the deepest love for the land. The western prairie seemed to homogenize the landscape. One, farm was, one farmstead was the next. Low hills were places to see more low hills. Tree-lined creeks were snakes who passed while the radio played weather, local news, and markets. But weather and markets were the news. His contrast lay at a higher, more abstract level than his pictures could show. Somehow, he thought, if a person could work at a higher level, he could show the human experience on Earth in a way that could not be seen otherwise. The yin and the yang were not really in the deep shadows behind bleached boards of a loading chute. No, they lay in the constant battle of growth and death in a fertile land of a dying culture, in the elusive, subtle complexity of a flat horizon over upright grass, in the native's visual, rich world against which a visitor shading his eyes in the glare, and in the timeless memories bound so tightly to the calling of an insect. So that's really simply an example of um, using, um, you know, using a whole bunch of um, simple observations of what it means to somebody to remember the sound of an insect in a particular place, in a particular part of the world, at a particular time in life. I'd like to uh, go on and, and take some uh, material now from, um, <clears throat> from a chapter called Red Dirt that's in this same book. A few years ago, I taught a, I taught a class in, over in the English department of all strange, strange events, graduate course in writing about nature, and I asked my students to, to write every day like I did, and of course, uh, they rebelled at that a little bit, but <laughs> we did it. And I thought that if I, were, if I were gonna ask them to do this, then I needed to do that myself, and I needed to uh, <clears throat> do it with some kind of a legitimate project. So I started writing about Oklahoma. I had been thinking about working on an Oklahoma book for quite a while, so I thought, well, I'll just start on that book right now. And uh, of course, Oklahoma, to me, at least in our part of Oklahoma, was all red dirt. So I just called it Red Dirt and started writing. Uh, and this, this is a uh, section out of that particular, particular chapter. Uh, this chapter really deals with exploration, and this section deals with the, the whole phenomenon of going exploring. 
And that's what scientists do, of course. They, they explore their whole lives. That's about my grandfather. Among the indicators of personality long gone from Earth, however, none surpasses a thin paper-bound booklet entitled Uranium in Oklahoma. My grandfather, intrigued by the Cold War, but manifesting that intrigue in his own particular way, bought a Geiger counter and went looking for uranium. He never found enough to pay for both his travels and his counter, much less to turn Oklahoma into a nuclear arsenal. What he did leave was a report of his travels and dozens of pictures, all of which my Aunt Helen had faithfully saved along with some of his rocks, which are probably radioactive. <laughs> What the Russians had delivered to my family in the 1950s was not a star-tipped missile warhead. It was a legitimate reason to get in your car, drive out in the country, and go dig around in red dirt. The Russians delivered this reason to, go, to simply go exploring as best one could in a part of the world where exploration was a reason for being. Indeed, the very word exploration was co-opted by the petroleum industry to the extent that it came, became synonymous with digging. Out on any two-lane highway passing through isolated towns with small drilling and oil well service companies, you inevitably see chain-link fence with pickups, stacks of pipes, sometimes portable rigs, other large equipment, only the initiated know how, or even better yet why, to use. The activity in these yards may have waxed and waned with the price of domestic crude, but tires, wheels, and lower door panels are always stained dirt red. Just like my Aunt Helen's white dog, Sugar, and the calcite crystal in her backyard, contact with the land makes a lasting change in the appearance of even heavy metal. Along the highway shoulder outside of town, beyond portable drilling rigs waiting for some human's decision on where and when to dig, lie dead skunks, possums, raccoons, casualties of nighttime tavern traffic. Dead skunks' white stripes are always stained red. If you stop and picked up a particularly fresh badger, thinking maybe the skin would make a nice addition to your collection of natural souvenirs, the belly will be stained red. Nothing, it seems, can live in this part of North America without showing evidence of having encountered Permian surface geology, soils laden with iron and derived from a period in Earth's history when the oxygen levels were high. My grandfather's car was always dirty. Red clay was always packed up under the wheel wells, splattered there along some muddy road where he drove like every wildcatter from early bo oil boom days, walking around with his geologist pick, convinced that there lay a financial windfall of incredible size and importance just beneath the next hill. The windfall never comes. Instead, we have photographs. A group of men stands on a cut bank beneath a tarp rigged as a tent. To the far right is my grandfather. He's smiling, squinting at the camera. We also have his notes on the back. Quote, first commercial carnotite find at cement Caddo County. Found in school gymnasium yard. Sold to Lucius Pitkin Incorporated, Grants, New Mexico. 13 tons ore, averaging 2.66 assay, brought $3,417 and a $2,400 bonus by the Atomic Energy Commission. Stringer was 70 feet long, averaged less than three feet wide and two feet thick. Had the deposit covered an acre, would have brought over $400,000. Lister Brothers of Chickasha Finders. Uh, I'll interject there that uh, we drive through Chickasha periodically um, going to Oklahoma and Texas, parts of Oklahoma and Texas, and um, I've never noticed this before, but I'll, I'll look for it next time. Um, my my brother-in-law, who is Karen's uh, brother, tells me that Lister Brothers, there's still a, a Lister Brothers company there, a truck stop maybe in, in Chickasha, Oklahoma. So if you're very, ever driving down there, you can, uh, you can take a look and see if, in fact, that's true. They may have a big sign right outside of town. And if so, it's probably these guys in this photograph. So... Had the deposit covered an acre, it would have brought over $400,000, Lister Brothers of Chica Chickasha finders. At the time, in the middle 1950s, $400,000 would indeed have been a small fortune for these men. Whatever geological vagaries had conspired to deliver the $6,000 
70-foot shallow stringer of carnitite to a schoolyard in southwestern Oklahoma had also conspired to tease this group of explorers with the same mineral bait that had snagged oil boomers a generation earlier and land boomers a generation before that. All six men in the Caddo County photograph could not have been full-time prospectors. Five of them are young enough to need a, need a day job. Only my grandfather looks carefree, standing there in a plaid shirt with his hand on his hip, a man beside a stringer. Uh, this whole chapter, Red Dirt, is really about exploration and about uh, the and part of it is, is really about not only exploration, but the difference between exploration and uh, agriculture, exploration and production agriculture, in the sense that um, when, I, when, I came to, when I came from Oklahoma to Nebraska and started interacting with uh, people who own ranches and farmland and uh, work the land the way... The way uh, people in production agriculture do, I was, was struck really by, by the fundamental nature of this activity where they, they worked and worked and worked to produce something, always with the understanding that nature could be a real problem for them at times, hailstorm sort of erasing a, a whole year's worth of work in, in a very few seconds, and that there was a there was a reason for a certain kind of conservatism if you're in production, if you're a farmer or a rancher. And uh, that's, you know, you, you have to invest with your hands to make something grow. Uh, Oklahomans are very different. Uh, you go out and dig in the dirt and find a fortune. I mean, that's sort of the mentality that what work is, what is something that really kind of looks like play to everybody else. So I think that, that very often science looks like play for that very reason. It's, it's simply exploration, unless it's producing, of course, a, a miracle, an economic miracle. Uh, more from Red Dirt. Uh, when, I, when I was an undergraduate, uh, as, a, as a senior in college, a friend of mine who, who lived in the dorm said, I'm going to take ornithology. He was a, a zoology major. I'm going to take ornithology. Why don't you take it with me? I said, sure. You know, I only had always liked birds, and only I you know, was a hunter, and I only had six hours to take to graduate. So I said, sure, I'll take ornithology. So we went over and talked to the faculty member who was teaching this course, and um, he agreed to let us in. Well, it turned out that this was George Sutton, who is a world-renowned scientist. I mean, a world-renowned writer and an artist and ornithologist. And by the time that semester was over, uh, I said, uh, I'm going to be an ornithologist just like this guy. Uh, well, it didn't happen, but uh, <clears throat> but there's, there's an awful lot about Sutton that I think is, is, is worth noting. And, that, and that's what this section is really about. More about um, exploration. My, oh, my father was a petroleum geologist, too, and that helps. Once in a while, my father would take me to the field. <clears throat> it must have been summer, although I distinctly remember being taken out of school one day to attend the oil show in Tulsa. There, in a gigantic exhibition hall, were shiny new versions of the filthy, greasy, red-splattered machines I'd seen men use to dig thousands of feet into the Oklahoma dirt. I picked up souvenirs, literature, and a yardstick. The company names on these items were household words, Halliburton, Schlumberger. The former are euphonic enough just to say it, often just to feel the L's roll off your tongue, Halliburton. The latter, Schlumberger, my first lesson in French pronunciation. I didn't know what these industrial behemoths did exactly, but I knew that when certain tasks needed to be done out in the field, someone would call them. Halliburton seemed to be synonymous with drilling mud. Schlumberger seemed to have a monopoly on electric logs. Every Oklahoma kid knew what drilling mud and electric logs were for. Mud was, and for that matter still is, an intricately concocted soup used to lubricate a drill bit and carry up the grindings. That is, samples. Electric logs were for occupying fathers. 
Late into the evening, cigarette smoke curling up into the ceiling, my father studied various colored ink tracings on strips of paper laid out on the dining room table over large maps. When he found the patterns he was looking for, he'd either make tiny circles, marks on the maps, or pack his stuff and go to the field. When he came back, our garage floor would be covered with little cloth bags, each containing what looked like and felt like fine, sharp gravel. Each bag would be carefully tagged and laid out in sequence. In daily conversation, the word samples had an Oklahoma meaning, a handful of rock chips through which you could see a hundred million years into the past. When summer arrived, I often got to go along, out to an oil well. Periodically, my father would stop and collect fossils. I learned the word brachiopod on one search trip, and I've never forgotten the telltale signs of bracts in limestone, or for that matter, in the marble tops of fine furniture. One saw planetary history in curving lines. One learned to see Earth in terms of its organisms and their natural products. As a senior in college, wondering what to do with a degree in mathematics, I enrolled in George Sutton's ornithology class. It may seem like a stretch, but at the time, birds in their nests didn't seem much different from Mesozoic vegetation and oil, or for that matter, carnotite. All were distributed in accordance with certain landscapes whether these were laid out on the surface or a mile below the ground, and the links between surface and subsurface were never questioned by anybody, adults or their children, with whom I interacted. The fundamental rules about one's relationship with nature had been established by the cultural milieu of Oklahoma. First, you studied landscape. Second, you assumed the landscape could tell you something about its history and its contents. Third, no matter whether you were looking for oil, or birds, you went out into that landscape physically and literally, and I might add mentally, as a way of life. Incidentally, the original manuscript uh, had uh, went out into that landscape uh, as a raison de tête, and the editor took that out and changed it. Sutton's classes were all, always small, usually small enough so we could all fit into his green 1952 three-hole Buick. There were no seat belts in 1952 Buicks. Ornithologists drive at highway speeds, but they also watch birds continually. If you fear for your physical safety, never get in a car with an ornithologist. If you have a fear of growing up ignorant of natural history, always get in a car with an ornithologist. George Sutton came to Oklahoma to write a book, eventually published in 1967, by the University of Oklahoma Press and entitled, of course, Oklahoma Birds. The subtitle is Their Ecology and Distribution with Comments on the Avifauna of the Southern Great Plains. The dust jacket illustration is a watercolor portrait of a Harlan's hawk, painted by Sutton. Scattered throughout are pen and ink drawings, the roadrunner with a limp Nemodophora sexlineatus hanging from its beak. Um, this is the uh, six-lined race runner an exceedingly rapid lizard. Roadrunner with a limp, Nemodophora sexlineatus hanging from its beak, an osprey in the act of alighting on a dead limb, two shovelers making a V of ripples on a shallow glassy pond, a loggerhead shrike gripping a thorny branch. All of these drawings have an inherent narrative. A roadrunner might be able to catch one of the fastest and most wily lizards ever to evolve, but a human could not. A shrike would choose a branch with thorns because shrikes stick their prey on thorns, a sort of larder for later consumption. On page 90 of Oklahoma Birds, there is a statement regarding turkey vultures. Quote, On Salt Plains National Wildlife Refuge, Alfalfa County, pair nested each summer, 1954, 1965, in tumble-down shed. The phraseology is telegraphic typical of systematic work in biological sciences. Inside the front cover, there is another statement regarding tur turkey vultures, this one in India Inc. in Sutton's handwriting. Quote, inscribed to my friend, John Janovey Jr., who will perhaps remember the baby buzzards in the old shack on the Salt Plains Refuge whenever he uses this book. George Mix Doc Sutton, Norman, Oklahoma, February 9, 1968. I remember the baby buzzards well. Crawling into the dim shadows through a hole in the boards, I'd come face to face with a turkey vulture chick old enough to stand up, 
thrust its beak out to within a few inches of my nose and slowly regurgitate an unbelievably rotten smelling mass of half digested roadkill rabbit. Whatever desire I had to interact with adolescent vultures disappeared at that moment. Describing this event, now 40 years in the past, the memory of that smell still makes my stomach wrench. <laughs> There's no way to describe it. Wherever he went, Sutton carried a shotgun, and wherever my father went, he carried sample bags. When Sutton needed evidence, irrefutable, tangible evidence of what geological co collision had attracted Oklahoma or allowed to flourish there, he would raise his shotgun and collect a sample. When my father needed evidence, irrefutable, tangible evidence of what geological collision had distributed far beneath his feet, he stood by the mud trough of the slush pit and collected rock chips, washed them, bagged them, tagged them, and took them back to a cheap motel room or sometimes a trailer beside a rig and studied them under a microscope. Sutton's tools consisted of scissors, forceps, sticks, cotton batting, cornmeal, borax, carbon tetrachloride, needles, threads, pins, and cardboard. My father's tools consisted of forceps, small metal trays of exactly the right shape so that rock chip samples could easily be returned to their bag, and a set of beautifully sharpened colored pencils. Sutton's products were bird skins, warblers, vireos, wrens, sandpipers, beautifully prepared, preened, and carefully labeled with standard tags tied to their crossed feet, placed in a white steel case with flat wooden drawers and a small box of dichloride crystals to discourage insects. My father's products were maps, locations and topography of particular, and often cryptically named shales and sands far below the ground, and decisions, keep drilling or set casing. Sutton also produced maps, in this case distributions of nesting species, locations where species have been sighted, all linked back to a database with dates, space-time continuing, continuum of moving animals. Sutton's database consisted of small loose-leaf notebooks. One section was a daily chronicle of events, where he went, who he was with, weather conditions, observations on habitat. The other section was a species list. Each species had its own pages with chronological entries. Most of this material was typed on a manual typewriter with a carbon ribbon. Whatever was handwritten was written in permanent India ink. Sutton's notebooks would last as long as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Nowadays, this information would be put into computer files and would be called a relational database. Assuming there is no nuclear holocaust in the next thousand years, assuming that museum and library archivists do their work from millennium, and I might say, uh, assuming governments uh, pony up the money to uh, sustain libraries and museums, assuming there is no nuclear holocaust in the next thousand years, assuming that museum and library archivists do their work from millennium, assuming our institution still exists, then a doctoral student writing her thesis on the history of ornithology will be able to put on a pair of white gloves, open those Sutton notebooks, turn the brittle pages, and read his handwritten notes clearly as any art historian could read a Rembrandt drawing. The relational database, however, will be gone. Gone into that same technological hell where lies every spreadsheet, every unpublished novel, every committee report, every email not printed out on acid-free paper, preserved in archive quality folders away from the sunlight, and every hard drive not confiscated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Homeland Security. As a nation, we've produced ephemerality. As an individual, Sutton produced a permanent and personal vision of the world as it existed for, in Oklahoma for a 35-year period. As an individual, my father produced a personal, permanent vision of the Earth as it existed in what we now call Oklahoma for a 400 million year period. My father's maps were large, made of some kind of high-quality drawing class, cloth. Sutton's maps were notebook paper. Both men had a lifetime's worth of these constructions, snapshots of the planet as viewed from within their professions and their moments of time, frozen forever in the products of their hands and minds. So I'm checking the clock. I have... Uh, let me... Uh, 
let me digress just a little bit and uh, talk about my mother. Uh, <clears throat> my mother was uh, uh, never never went to college until she was uh, diagnosed with terminal breast cancer, and then she decided to go to college and major in English. But she was very much a uh, First of all, she died very young at the age of uh, 49, uh, long when I was still in my 20s. My sister was, was two or three years younger, uh, long before we were uh, old enough to actually sit down with our parents and talk about their, their upbringing. So when my sister and I started, uh, well, then my father also died young, and then, um, well, he in the, sense, in the middle in the meantime, after my mother had died young, my father then remarried. And then he died young, and then my stepmother remarried. And so I have this set of step parents that are very, very close and dear, uh, dear to us that we, we visit regularly. So, but they owned two homes, one in Oklahoma City and one in Texas. So eventually they decided to get rid of the one in Oklahoma. <clears throat> and so it was filled with, and, and in the meantime, my grandfather had also died, and then my aunt had died. So here was all this uh, you know, property in Oklahoma full of the lifetime collection of folks going back to the late 1800s. And my sister and I uh, then went down there and excavated it and, and took uh, truckloads to recycling and saved truckloads. And as a result of that, uh, I got about half of the photographs. My sister got the rest. And I started going through that material and realized here were two people that I really didn't know very well. <laughs> And, and had not had a chance to actually get acquainted with. So I had been threatening to write an Oklahoma book for a long, long time, and this book had taken several forms, um, but it finally took the title uh, Bernice and John. My mother's name was Lillian Bernice Locke, uh, so the title is Bernice and John, Finally Meeting Your Parents Who Died a Long Time Ago. So this book is uh, still not finished, but it's, it's well, well along. And this, uh, this section that I'm getting ready to read is about my early relations with my mother. And, and it sort of reflects, I think, on uh, how, how I, I don't think I was born with certain kinds of attitudes. I think I was given these attitudes, not only by a father who took me out to the field, but by a mother who was really a very, very remarkable person. Bernice Locke had a special sound reserved. Well, if, if any of my former department chairs were here, they would understand this completely. Bernice Locke had a special sound reserved for those in positions of power. Nowhere in any of the papers, books, photographs, and letters left by my parents is any evidence whatsoever of how this quiet sense of rebellion, this intelligent secular liberalism and rationality arose. There is no way to reconstruct the environment of 400 block West Maple in Oklahoma City in 1915, a short eight years after statehood, to find out the conditions that produce women with a piercing but knowing gaze who ask only that leadership answer to the people instead of people answering to leadership. There's an off, awesome humanness to this humanness to this attitude, expressed routinely as she took her young son on her lap opened a small book, and began to read. Today, nearly 70 years after the fact, her vocal inflections are branded on my brain. That thin volume from which she read is among my most precious and treasured material possessions. Late at night, I sometimes pull it down from the high shelf where it rests and open it, staring at the pages in silence. Once again, I am four years old, sitting and resting with her arm around me, sitting on her lap, and I can hear my mother's voice. Poor old Jonathan Bing went out in his carriage to visit the king. But everyone paused and said, look at that, Jonathan Bing has forgotten his hat. Poor old Jonathan Bing. Well, Jonathan Bing is not the poor victim here. With my mother's inflection, he becomes a character struggling with an authority who he knows demands respects, but simply cannot get it because everyone, quote unquote, is not able to understand how a king might receive Jonathan without a hat. By her reading, Lillian Bernice makes not only the king that not only the king's problem, 
but also, indeed, perhaps especially, the crowds read society's problem. We never know whether the king cared what Jonathan wore or not. The king may have been a wonderful, beer-guzzling, bear-hunting good old boy who'd slap Jonathan on the back, say, thanks for showing up, regardless of what you're wearing, and toss him a couple of gold coins. Bernice cut him no slack. If he'd been that kind of a king, Jonathan would never have worried about what to wear, and there would have been no poem. She cuts everyone, quote-unquote, even less slack, however, in failing to describe the king himself. The poet leaves that personality to enter to our imagination but clearly puts being at the mercy of the mob. Even when Jonathan goes home and puts on a new hat, he's still at odds with the military-industrial complex. But up in the palace, a soldier said, Hi, you can't see the king. You've forgotten your tie. He'd forgotten his tie. Needless to say, before this poem is over, Bing has forgotten various parts of his wardrobe and finishes encounter with the king by writing a short note. If you please will excuse me, I won't come to tea, for home's the best place for all people like me. Perhaps there is research to be done on the subliminal effects of vocalizations on very young children, research akin to that done on bird chicks hearing their parents call through an eggshell, thus establishing worldviews. To Lillian Bernice and now to her children, it's those in positions of power who must prove their worthiness to their subjects, not vice versa. But it's the crowd, the mob, society that is the real tyrant. And home is the best place like, for people like me has an immensely powerful and metaphorical truth to it, especially if, like Bernice, you've made your home your library. In Tulsa, at the age of four years, seven months, my parents decided that I need to start kindergarten, regardless of the turmoil in Europe and in the Far East, and the obvious worry about the integrity of their nuclear family, and regardless of whatever positions my father was trying to obtain. I don't know whether this decision was based on their desire to get me out of the house because I became too bored, or that their attempts to teach me to read were successful enough so that they were confident I could handle Tulsa kindergarten. It's also entirely possible that my mother was desperate to rid me of whatever, whatever Cajun influence remained from our time in Louisiana, and concluded that formal schooling in Oklahoma might do the trick. Uh, incidentally, uh, Ed, last summer, uh, Karen and I were coming back from Oklahoma and took a, took a, a detour to Tulsa to just simply find, uh, if I could, well, I, I found the school where I started kindergarten pretty readily, but then we started looking for the house because I had gone through all my family records and found no record whatsoever of that address where we lived in Tulsa. So we started driving around and around, and I started walking around and around that school, knowing that it wouldn't be very far until I found the house that just connected with, with my mind. That's the place. And so I stopped and took lots and lots of pictures. I have no idea whether it was really the place. But uh, if, it, if it was, then it's exactly the place where I was sitting when what happens next in this reading happened. About this time, I'd gotten my fir first pair of glasses, but I'd never seen snow. So naturally, you can tell what's coming next. First time I went outside in the winter, some kid threw a snowball and hit me in the face. So the big blob of ice stuck between my glasses and my eye. My mother laughed and told me I needed to make a snowball and throw it back. Throughout the years that followed, once in a while I'd hear a hushed conversation about our lives in Tulsa and about my mother telling me more than once to fight back. I don't remember any fights, at least that I participated in, but today I love conflict so long as it's somewhat civil, conducted on a level playing field, and does not involve weapons or potential for bodily harm. I believe Bernice also loved such conflict, or at least considered it interesting, especially if from afar, and even more so if it involved words and ideas. Months later, after the first snowball incident, when it warmed up, another kid threw a rock and hit one of the neighbor boys in the forehead opening a big gash. The picture in my mind is that of a red stone of some kind being launched from far across the street, arcing gracefully through a great distance until it descended upon my friend, whapping him in the head and sending the blood gushing. In retrospect, I'm sure the rock fight took place on a much smaller field of battle. Any kid who at that age could throw a rock as far as it was thrown in my memory would have ended up in the major leagues. 
But then again, maybe he did. We rarely know what happens to people we knew in kindergarten, especially if our parents move around. Regardless of the thrower's eventually, eventual athletic career, on that day the blood flowed freely and there was immediate and frantic talk of stitches, making quite an impression on my five-year-old brain. My mother did not laugh at the rock and the blood. I'm sure she was thinking about the difference of rocks and snowballs and about what she would be doing at that moment had the rock hit her own son, sending splinters of glass into his eye. Snowballs and rocks were my first memorable experience with the way human beings interact with the purely physical properties of Earth. These missiles were also my first lesson in the choice of weapons and how such choices could constrain one's ability to resolve conflict in the best interest of all concerned. There have been many times in the past 60 years, 60, when I wish that people in positions of major responsibility throughout the world had learned that same lesson. An extremely well-educated minister, acquaintance of mine, phrased this lesson somewhat differently not long ago as we were standing around prior to a social event discussing the latest news. Uh, incidentally, that was Otis Young, who's now deceased. You can't solve those problems by killing people, he said. Those problems, quote unquote, could easily be any of the dozen we read about daily in which the participants decide that solutions involve killing other human beings. As my friend reflected on the human behavior revealed by the news, I found myself wishing that Lillian Bernice Locke Janovey were still alive and willing to stand, or better yet, sit on a rock in her long skirt front of a television camera and assess the brain power of elected officials. Were she alive, she would be 95 years old. You can't solve those problems by killing people, she would say. And the look on her face, the emphasis in her voice, would pierce her soul and render the judgment of stupid even through a flat screen monitor. The period from December 11th, 1915, her birthday, to December 11th, 2010, which is when I happen to be writing editing this sentence, to December 11, 2010, corresponds roughly to a century of slaughter unparalleled in human history and described in detail by Samantha Power in her book, A Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide. Were she alive, my mother would read this book and cry, although her tears would likely be silent late at night instead of outright sobbing that I witnessed upon the dropping of an atomic bomb on Japan. She would remember most the events of Samantha Power described. Such memories would make her thankful to have lived in Oklahoma, deep in the heart of a nation untouched by the obvious violence washing across much of the rest of the world. But to anyone who professed that, quote, it can't happen here, unquote, she would turn and stare and that penetrating look of judgment, of wonder at this individual's credulity would pass across her face. The uncontrolled, out-of-class emotions that I see in the thousands of young people I encounter today is not the happy excitement produced by interest in the natural world, or excitement that extends from discovery fueled by such interest, that is, the excitement taught by Bernice and John, and taught by example. Instead, it's the emotion of politics and judgment, of athletic victory, of religion battling with secular humanism, of creationists, versus evolutionary biology, and especially of significant others so completely linked electronically that I find myself wondering whether this wonderful relationship is actually a cage or a tether. The emotion I see on television is that of the soap opera, ultra-conservative commentators claiming to be balanced, the actor evangelists on their personal power ego trips, the Middle Eastern parents crying over their dead children, the criminal and the cop, centuries-old ethnic hatreds, victorious celebrating the victory no matter what the contest. What I never see are the emotions of appreciation, understanding, and wonder, the emotions of my parents. I do not know whether the traits of my parents described in the above paragraph were passed along to my sister and me through DNA or through daily interactions that occur between people and a nuclear family. I know, however, that we both possess these traits, at least in part. I'm not bragging or gloating or otherwise claiming superiority in any way because of such attitudes and behaviors my sister and I possess, although on the surface they appear to be somewhat noble. There are sure times, however, that, think it would, that I think it would be really nice to be aggressive and rich when victory and money might be more worthy objectives than pleasure derived from someone else's art, words on a page that require thought, 
and personal satisfaction from a job brought to closure. But if my parents were still alive, even in their 90s, I'm sure they would have their say regarding my values. And I'm still their child, and they would still feel that parental responsibility. Johnny, my mother would say, possibly from her wheelchair at the nursing home, have you read this book? And there among her newspapers, open to the editorial pages, would be something heavy, like Karen Armstrong's The Battle for God. She wouldn't even have to mention religious conflict. The look on her face, the tone in her voice, would tell her opinion of the stupidity involved. My father, maybe from an adjoining wheelchair, would ask to be taken outside for a smoke and a few minutes listening to a mockingbird. Then he would condemn, as he did from the early 1950s on until the day he died, his nation's dependence on foreign crude. And both of these people would be right on target. So I'm um, checking the clock, uh, Meredith. Am I doing okay? Doing okay. Uh, the next two things are a little bit lighter. Uh, there's a sigh of relief, a little bit lighter. Um, but one of these, <clears throat> this one is actually also right out of that chapter called Red Dirt. Uh, and this is the first paragraph that I that I wrote once I decided that that, that whole chapter needed to be... Oh, no, I'm sorry about that. This is... Uh, He's reading out of his own book. He doesn't even know where his writing came from. That happens. Uh, so this is out of that chapter called uh, Through a Lens. And this is, but this still is the first paragraph that I wrote for that chapter. And I have a friend named Ben Vogt, who, I, who was a doctoral student over, well, he's a PhD now. He was a doctoral student over in the English department. And he was in this class called Writing About Nature. And I ended up on his, his supervisory committee. Uh, ben is a magnificent writer and a poet. And so over the last two or three years, we've read one another's work, and, and I've sent him things periodically, and sometimes he has time to read them. And when I sent him this, I said, Ben, I'm thinking about uh, writing a chapter called Through a Limbs, uh, and this is where I'm going to start. He, he read it, and he wrote back and said, this doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, you know, why? Why are you, what does this have, what's this all about? So at that point, I decided I needed to write the rest of the chapter and put this at the end <laughs> instead of at the beginning. <laughs> so this is really um, uh, sort of what goes through your mind when you're looking through, a when you spend your whole life looking through a microscope. And this is about an infusion culture. Uh, it's actually about trying to impose your will on nature but it's really about an infusion culture. Infusion culture is nothing more than a bunch of vegetation put in a jar and you fill up the jar with water and just leave it set there. And over the next few weeks, of course, it grows all kinds of stuff. It grows bacteria and fungus and protozoans and paramecium a lot of times. And all of this really wild, rapidly moving microscopic stuff. Well, one of the things that my father did when I was a child was he went out in the backyard and got a bunch of grass and made one of these cultures, put it out in the garage. And um, then after a week or two in the hot Oklahoma garage, he, he, he pulled out a little microscope that he had had when he was a kid. And he puts a drop of that water on it. And I was hooked and at that point. I mean, absolutely, totally hooked. And that, that's when I became a microscopist. What metaphorical lens don't necessarily train you for, however, is encounter with those creatures living at the lower limits of resolution, namely most of the occupants of fruit jars filled with water and grass then left to stew for a couple of weeks. These so-called infusion cultures, assembled by anyone anywhere on Earth, useful for purposes ranging from mystification of preteens to the writing of doctoral dissertations and costing virtually nothing, fruit jar, grass, water, to make an ocean kelp hold fast look almost manageable. Only the amoebas move slowly enough to track easily with lenses that magnify a thousand times. Everything else careens at speeds best measured in body lengths per second with no discernible purpose or destination. Where did they really come from, you ask? Were they there in the grass before I put that stuff in the jar? Were they there in the water from my faucet 
the very water that I drink every day before I made this mess? Did they ride in on the air, the same air that I breathe continuously? Did I inadvertently make a community with a defined life and a compressed history? This last question is easy to answer, yes. In another week, there may be occupants not present now, and some of the dominant forms will have disappeared from the mix. In a month, nothing you recognize today will still be around. If microorganisms could think and write, you see the rise and fall of a great jar nation in only six weeks. And the lesson of limited resources would stick in your mind until you became president of another great nation, the one your grandfather came to when things got intolerable in Bohemia or Ireland or Sudan or Mexico. If microorganisms could write, their story might also seem vaguely familiar to a work laden with metaphorical baggage. With your lens, you have fallen, Alice-like, into a round hole. And just as Alice-like, the results completely alter your perception of reality. At first, the denizens of this tiny world reveal no sense of purpose, no sense of direction, no awareness of the past, present, or future. Nothing that connects them to any familiar signposts or behavioral traits by which we negotiate the realms of money, health, military adventure, agriculture, politics, sex, sports, or religion. You do not belong in this realm you have just entered. You have no idea what processes actually govern its existence, what its inhabitants do for a living, or how they got there. Only your education prevents you from deciding, like so long ago ancestors would have done, that they simply appeared spontaneously. Slowly, very slowly, your evolved internal wiring, established neural circuits, past experiences begin to reassert themselves. That is your humanness. You are, after all, a human being. If you have any power at all, it's to impose your will on nature, at least in terms of interpretation. They eat, they mate, they fight, you think. Suddenly they sort themselves out into a pattern you recognize. Thousands of them, all vibrating and smacking into one another, have gathered around an air bubble. Oh, you think, they need air. They want air. You have absolutely no idea what they need. They are incapable of want. Your conclusion is fantasy. Five minutes have passed. What you've seen through this lens is an irresistible drive to impose your own guiding mythology on the natural world and thus believe that you have, in fact, also imposed your will. I think that uh, with that, uh, I'll probably maybe bring this afternoon to a close. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for coming today. Oh, thank you. I am going to 